journey. And oops, okay. And we, so we had, we had uh, sort of all the weathers of the world all uh, in, in one afternoon on the way up. In fact, it got so, so bad when the hail started that um, the leadership wondered if we should turn around and go back. But the students said, no, 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 we have to press on. So what is pilgrimage? This is a little bit of the sort of basic theory that I shared with students. To be on a journey toward a place over the horizon in a world of impending revelation, a stranger in a landscape, fierce or gentle, or both in turns, that offers challenge, solace, reorientation, restitution, new beginnings. And of course, there we are, climbing Mount Brandon. Pilgrimage is also, I want to say, the et eternal movement that is human life, leaving place and entering place, physical or spiritual, in exile or an elective journey, being the stranger, meeting the stranger, transformations large and small, healing, petition, arriving where one is, to recall Columbus' prayer. Um, this picture on the right is uh, from the well of St. John, and it's one of the first holy wells that we visited. Um, I love that circular image with the fish in the center of it. Um, it's not a universal uh, image for holy wells, but it, it certainly seems to have power just as an image here. Um, it reminds me of a labyrinth. It reminds me of stonework. It reminds me of the Paleolithic stone uh, carvings that we see in Ireland. Um, so just down the path to the right there, um, we entered into a little area where there was a well um, and our guide, uh, Brother Sean, who is a, a Christian brother and the Irish Christian brothers was our guide to the holy wells and to much else in Ireland. And he led a little devotional there and the students were invited to just drink right out of this holy well. And some of them uh, did that and some of them thought better of it and didn't do it, but nobody got sick. So we did have uh, several um, experiences of holy uh, wells in this. This is at the holy well, there's brother Sean himself, um, uh, often pointing that finger to show us something to look at never pointing a finger at anyone. He was the gentlest, least um, uh, critical person I've ever met maybe in my life. He was just wonderful, but he was so excited about showing the students this environment. In this area here, you can see the Holy Well. The students are around it. They were, um, they were told about circumambulating and what uh, pilgrims would typically do would be to take to recite the rosary as they go around and around and around the well. And there would be a prescribed number of times that you walk around the well. Um, and particular wells had different traditions about that. So um, here's a, a student drinking out of the well. She was one of the, the brave uh, ones who actually drank the water. There's a cup sitting there for any pilgrim who wishes to drink. Um, so there, so I wanna say there's a physical and external kind of pilgrimage. And then there's always also an interior, internal kind of pilgrimage. You know, in the best of worlds, these come together, these happen together. Sometimes we can't go on the outward or physical one. And so we, find ways to go on inner and interior ones. But in all cases, there is, this is, I want to say, an existential experience or what I'm calling here a total existential experience, right? It's not just tourism, um, although I do think there's a sort of a thin line between tourism. Our students weren't really Christian pilgrims. They were students, right, going to see Ireland. And then we made this pilgrimage to to experience and experiment with what it is to be an Irish Catholic pilgrim, right? Um, so there was a bit of tourism in it, but I can tell you, and you'll see at the end, that this became something else. I think Elizabeth Fetch last week said, you know, we, I was just with a secular group, but oh, at, by the end, we really felt like we were pilgrims or we really felt this, this kind of sacred thing happening. Um, the Christian tradition also, of course, has a, a, um, 
uh, a tradition of interior pilgrimage that can happen when you're all alone. And um, this is an Irish uh, poem that has been actually set to music by Samuel Barber. Um, but I love this, this poem, Odd to be all alone in a little cell with nobody near me. Um, I can't even actually see my whole thing because of you guys, oops. Um, before the last pilgrimage to death, singing the passing hours to cloudy heaven. Um, that's uh, one of the hermit songs written, um, they're Irish, they're written in around the ninth century. So um, that's another kind of pilgrimage, you know, the hermit, the, the anchor, right, um, the person in his cell can experience pilgrimage. Uh, ways of thinking about it now, this is sort of the, the most academic it gets. So the manifestation of the sacred in the profane. I know Michael McLaughlin is here and he's just, um, he's just read a whole bunch of Eliade for a class he's taking uh, with me. Uh, so Michael, you could probably do this, this by, uh, by heart here. But what uh, Eliade talks about, Eliade, he's now uh, passed, but he was 20th century uh, historian of religion, philosopher of religion, really, in a way. Um, and Eliade gave us a lot of language for talking about some of the things that happen in pilgrimage, because he talked about the sacred breaking into profane time and space. He called this hierophany, or sacred appearance. Um, and he thought that when this happened, the, the religious person, as he called it, the, the, the homo religiosus, he called it, found home again when the sacred manifests itself, when it breaks into the profane. There is a kind of a homecoming or a finding of the center of the world, the axis mundi. All right? So that is one way of thinking about uh, pilgrimage. I think I skipped. No, maybe I didn't. Yeah, so this is a kind of an example of that and a little bit of poetry uh, to aid in the example. <clears throat> so um, this actually, this is ga the Galerus Oratory. We don't know how old this thing is, but it's very, very old. It could go back to the fifth century. Um, you know, there's no mortar in that. That's just stacked stone. And it's lasted just like that for centuries and centuries through um, the, the wind and the rain and the constant rain and the constant wind in Ireland. So this is part of our, uh, this actually Mark Connor's son sitting, sitting there on that, um, on that rock, looking at the Galerus Oratory, which sometimes they call it the, the first church in Ireland. It is on the St. Brendan pilgrimage path, all right? So it is, it is thought that pilgrims would have come by this um, prayer hut, basically is what it is. Um, and, but Seamus Heaney, the famous Irish poet, poet wrote a beautiful poem about it that I think in a way illustrates what Eliade is talking about when he talks about the, um, the manifestation of the sacred in, in the profane world. So this is Heaney's poem. You can still feel the community pack this place. It's, it's like going into a turf stack, a core of old dark walled up stone, a yard thick. When you're in it alone, you might have dropped a reduced creature to the heart of the globe. No worshiper would leap up to his God off this floor. Founded there like heroes in a barrow, they sought themselves in the eye of their king under the black weight of their own breathing and how he smiled on them as out they came, the sea a censer and the grass a flame. I especially um, love that, that poem because, um, well, for so many reasons, but the idea of nature itself bursting into the flame and the, and the uh, incense of the censer. Um, that's Eliadian, right? That's the way Eliade talked about the holy breaking in to our profane world. But another thing I really love about that particular um, scene is that one of the students who was there who had really was such a secular, she was from such a secular upbringing, she'd really never, I think, never been inside a church probably. She knew a lot. She was extremely bright. 
she really just hadn't experienced anything like this. And so what she wanted to do before she left Ireland, and she, she got Brother Sean to, to do this with her, to take her at night into this place to light a match in there because she wanted to see what that was like to see the light inside that place. And then she wanted to know what a censer was. And so Brother Sean actually gave her a stick of incense and she stood outside this Galarus oratory in the night burning that stick of incense. And the next day I saw her and she was herself an example of Eliade's sacred in, in, the, in the profane world. She was just glowing with the experience of this having happened and how Brother Sean and his great love for the students had carried her there and how she'd had the experience of the scent of incense and the light inside that place. So this is also inside that place, by the way, because it's a very special light in there. This was in daytime. And this is one of our students actually reading the Seamus Heaney poem in, inside the space. Um, so another way we talk about what happens on a pilgrimage is we say communitas happens. So as an experience of community. Again, this was discussed last week. People, or people travel in a group. You, you form bonds with people you don't know before you start. You form stronger bonds with the people you travel with. So um, various thinkers have given us language to, um, to think about the communitas. So I've kind of lumped them all together here to say that communitas comes from having been in a liminal space, a space between spaces, neither here nor there, a space where you're open to transformation, to finding community in the experience of what um, Durkheim, the sociologist of religion, called collective effervescence. You feel something there that is a part of the community that you would not feel alone, but it has, it has been generated by the shared experience of the community. And then once in that, you are participating in a system of symbols that gives meaning to the inexplicable, perhaps, um, and makes suffering sufferable. So I think back again to Alice's experience of coming uh, to Ireland and learning of the death of close friends. And somehow she understood this as um, this pilgrimage is making that suffering sufferable for her. So I keep coming back to these instances of suffering. Another poem, a poem uh, that I would rather hear and read in German, but I think I'm not actually up to it um, or to translating it. So I'm giving you another's translation. But um, again, this is in a way about the manifestation of the holy in the landscape. And this happens in Ireland in such a magnificent way, partly because of the just the sheer beauty of the place, but I think partly because of the treading of saints across this territory for so long and of pilgrims in their, in their footsteps. So here's a poem by uh, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke. Already my gaze is upon the hill, the sunny one, at the end of the path which I've only just begun. So we are grasped by that which we could not grasp at such great distance, so fully manifest. And it changes us, even when we do not reach it, into something that, hardly sensing it, we already are. A sign appears echoing our own sign but what we sense is the wind against us. I don't think that needs much commentary, probably. I'd, I'd like to just point to this phrase in particular, we are grasped by that which we could not grasp. Um, and so part of what we study in this religion course is this sort of idea of phenomenology and the way in which the phenomena we look at sometimes is looking back at us, right? And we see this um, happening, I think, in this pilgrimage idea and in the landscape of Ireland in particular. <clears throat> so history and scope of the pilgrimage, you know where we are on the outline. I, I said I'd go quickly through this. It's global. It's all over the world. Um, we've done so many different uh, types of um, 
pilgrimage in, in our coursework over the years, not in this course, but, but in other courses. And in fact, um, in another course on pilgrimage I taught, we ended the course after going to Japan, India, Saudi Arabia, uh, several other places, we ended the course going literally to Washington DC to the Vietnam War Memorial. And we treated the whole piece as a pilgrimage. Um, so it was a class of, of mixed uh, religions, right? So we couldn't go to do a Christian pilgrimage exactly, but and in fact, we weren't all Americans, but we, we cajoled the non-American to come with us on the American pilgrimage. We drove up the valley. Um, we talked about the Confederate battlefields all the way up. Barney Badgett was with us on the, on the bus and helped sort of narrate what we were traveling through from the Civil War days. Uh, and then when we got to, um, when we got to Washington, uh, we went to Arlington Cemetery first, and when we crossed the bridge to come over to the lawn, to the mall, and to go to the, um, to the Vietnam War Memorial, and um, I shouldn't tell this long a story, but it's just an amazing story. We realized on the bridge that we were there on Memorial Day, and how that had not occurred to us, I don't know, but here came rolling thunder. I don't know if you know about rolling thunder, but it's thousands of motorcycles that start their Vietnam War veterans. They start in California and collect people all across the country and they wind up at the Vietnam War Memorial. So, you know, here we were, we felt this rumble, rumble, rumble. And then it turned out that we were surrounded by pilgrims who were the Vietnam War veterans coming to the Vietnam War Memorial and coming to Washington DC on this annual Memorial Day pilgrimage. So we ended up being uh, ensconced in a pilgrimage as we were doing a pilgrimage. It was really incredibly interesting. And one of our students started interviewing one of those guys on the motorcycle. Um, you know, those guys are great. They've got this long ponytails and they've got Jesus, you know, on their shirts and they've got crazy bumper stickers and stuff. Anyway, she started talking to him and then she disappeared and we feared we had lost her. <laughs> she maybe gone off into the sunset with this guy. But in fact, she showed up later on. And, you know, that that young woman turned out to be an anthropologist and she's teaching now um, at Virginia Tech in anthropology. Uh, she wrote a book on snake handling before she did that. So uh, anyway, wonderful things happen in pilgrimage. Christian pilgrimage. I love this citation from Robert Wilkin. Um, who uh, used to teach up at uh, uh, the University of Virginia. <clears throat> Sanctification of place was inevitable in a religion founded on history and the belief that God became flesh. That says an awful lot about pilgrimage and about sacred place in particular, sacred physical things, right? Sanctification of place means it has become sacred, right? So I, I really like that as a kind of heading for Christian pilgrimage. Um, so um, I'll just zip, zip, zip Egypt and the Anchorites is where we really begin a kind of understanding of Christian pilgrimage. It's amazing how strong Egyptian um, tradition is in various ways, iconography, in iconography and other ways in Ireland. That's another lecture. Uh, but if you've heard of the Desert Fathers and Mothers, they are these Egyptian um, anchorites who would live in huts, but pilgrimage began as people went out to visit these holy people who were living as anchorites in the Egyptian desert. Okay? Uh, and then we get pilgrimage to sites of holy events like Jerusalem, for example, and I know Father Tuck is going to be talking about Jerusalem, so I won't belabor that, but I did, um, I do incorporate this pilgrim from Spain, a woman, uh, Egeria, uh, and do a lot with her in a course I do, and she's really a fascinating figure because she walks, she, she walks this long pilgrimage and she gets to places like Mount Sinai and she talks, she reads scripture when she gets there. You know, she's like a fifth century person, sixth century maybe. She's very early as a pilgrim to Jerusalem. 
then we have pilgrimage to sites of holy people, not just to sites where holy events like the crucifixion happen, but to sites of holy people. So Rome is a pilgrimage site because uh, of a lot of folks and a lot of things going on there now, but early on, Peter and Paul were both in Rome and both were martyred there. So uh, places where the saints are martyred turn out to be e extremely important places for pilgrimage. And as you know from last week, uh, Santiago uh, is a pilgrimage to the site of a holy person, St. James. Then finally, we come to Celtic pilgrimage. Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Isle of Man, Cornwall, and Brittany all, all count as Celtic pilgrimage sites. So now here we come to the sort of where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, the experience making an Irish pilgrimage. And I, I say in both sit senses, because um, in a way I had to make this up. Like I had to go there uh, a year ahead and kind of figure out where we're gonna be and how we can make a pilgrimage work out of the spaces that we can actually get to. And that's really how I came to Brendan. Uh, because he was all over the spaces we were going to be in, in the west of Ireland, um, and in Kerry, and the Dingle Peninsula. So, so I, I really did make this pilgrimage in a sense, and then we made the pilgrimage in the sense of, of doing the thing, of taking the pilgrimage. Um, the things that are so important in the, in the Celtic experience, of course, are um, the landscape on the one hand, and so um, the numinous, I call it the numinous presence in the natural world, the water, the wind, the fog, um, just looking off the coastline down those craggy cliffs into that icy blue water and feeling the wind in your face is it's just a different experience from anything I've had uh, certainly in this in this country. It's just extraordinary. You really feel like you're on the end of the world. And you are when you're standing there in Dingle, of course, the next thing is North America. So there's this wonderful sense of being at, really at the end of one world, uh, at least. Springs and wells become holy springs and holy wells, right? There's a lot of water in Ireland. It rains a lot. And there are a lot of springs. And, you know, chances are if you come by a spring, that spring has some story connected to some holy event, some sacred presence. And the wells also. And I'll have some images of wells. Um, oops. Um, trees. Uh, the white thorn tree is uh, especially when we were there, May, very important tree. It's in all the hedgerows and, you know, it's just ubiquitous. It's everywhere, but it's the tree of lots of legend. Um, and this is pre-Christian legend. The, uh, the thing I won't talk too much about, but is such a factor um, in Celtic pilgrimage and especially in Ireland is that so much of these, so many of the sites, especially these natural sites, were pagan uh, sites before they were Christian sites, but they were holy to the pagans before they became holy to the Christians. Um, so, you know, the white thorn, I could talk all night about the white thorn, but I won't. Um, stone, you know, the massive amount of stone all over the place. And I have here one of these uh, Neolithic um, um, stone carvings, right? These, you could just come upon these. Uh, all over Ireland. Some people long time ago <laughs> did these, right? Thousands of years ago. Um, so the, the landscape itself just is extraordinary. And it's extraordinary in ways that easily can be called sacred or can become sacred to the pilgrim. People, of course, um, in Ireland, the people who make uh, for pilgrimage are St. Patrick, St. Columba, St. Bridget and St. Brenda the Navigator and, and dozens of others, right? These are, the, I think there are 12 that are considered sort of the 12 saints of, of Ireland, but we'll just stick with these four and I'm really not gonna talk about any of them uh, except Brendan. Although I would love to talk more about all of them. <clears throat> they're, all, they're all in the course, but they're not all in this course tonight. Um, so I also wanted to say just on, um, the, the theme of the suffering of the land, uh, suffering in the history, the tradition of the Irish people, um, we were pretty frequently reminded of, especially the potato blight. We went to some of the um, 
some of the villages that where everyone had died of the potato uh, of, of hunger in the potato blight. Uh, this is a cemetery. These all these little stones, they're just like makeshift graves that were put there in, you know, mass numbers uh, during the potato famine. Um, and here's just a it's a sort of a uh, tribute to those who died in the potato blight. Um, God never arranged that it be so that the poor be evicted in the cold or locked gloomily in the poor house. Um, what a betrayal of God's poor with no riches but hard labor uh, from youth till death's day. Um, so that is in the same site where we see all these graves. Uh, so I say the background of our pilgrimage land holds the memory of this suffering, but also of Alice and her loss who was with us of unknown suffering. All of these make up um, the texture which I think is part and parcel of the uh, experience of the sacred in this land. So here we are with Brendan. Um, Brendan was, um, uh, you, you can see his dates there. They're all like fourth, fifth, fifth to sixth century characters, all the great early saints. Um, so this picture on the left is Brendan as he um, appears in the statue form at the Holy Well, uh, which is supposed to have been the well where he was himself baptized. Um, as a child, he was given over to St. Ita, and St. Ita nursed him there and drew him up in the way of the church. And he eventually, uh, of course, uh, became himself a monk and then founded monasteries. This is um, our group. And this is the back of a statue. It's impossible to really take a picture from the front of it because you can't get far enough away. Um, so this is Brendan uh, at Brendan's Bay, it's called. He's sort of heading out into the sea there. So that sort of gives you the sense of the navigator. Um, heading, heading off to sea. And this is very near his birthplace, actually near Trelli. <clears throat> so his hagiography, right? Hagiography is a sacred story. Um, there are a couple of primary sources for this. The Vita Brindani from about 800 of the Common Era, many years after his uh, own life. And then the Navigatio, uh, which is from even later, at least the earliest extant copy of it is from later, from about 900. Uh, there he is, that, um, that image of him is from the, um, uh, ugh, lost the name of this cathedral. It's a, a, a Irish Renaissance a cathedral full of this beautiful stained glass, including a lot of stained glass by Harry Clark, who's that, not, that is not Harry Clark, but Harry Clark is one of the most famous of the Irish stained glass artists from the time of the sort of uh, Celtic revival in Ireland. And um, this church's name will come to me, but I didn't, I didn't write it down, so I'm not remembering it. Um, okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about these texts in which Brendan um, figures. The, the uh, Navigatio is extremely long uh, and very involved. And you know what happens is we have Brendan embarking on a journey with 14 monks. Um, he's in a a, a a boat with sort of you know uh, skin sides, a wooden boat with skin sides and sail. Um, his idea came to him to take this journey really from a bishop. I guess he did it partly in obedience to the bishop who said to him he'd had this dream and in the dream he saw the promised land uh, or the land of paradise and he thought that Brendan should go in search of this. Um, so they fasted, the 14 of them fasted for 40 days. Um, there's lots and lots in the in the uh, Navigatio, lots of scripture citations. So, you know, they're fasting for 40 days, sort of in imitation of Christ at the temptation, but also in, tem in imitation of uh, the wandering in the wilderness of Israel. There are many connections to the Exodus 
um, in Irish literature generally, but uh, especially in this particular piece. So when they were hungry, um, they're out on the ocean, right? And when they get hungry, well, they start out hungry. When they get hungry, they miraculously find food. You know, it's just like, oh, they come upon an island and there's somebody who's already laid the table for them and they enjoy themselves and eat and then they go uh, on their way. So that, that's happening all the way through. Uh, most of the real stopping places where you get a lot of narration of a particular place are on holy days. They're either, you know, days of Easter or the, almost every Sunday, right, which is always called the octave, uh, they're doing some kind of, you know, Eucharistic uh, celebration. So you get a lot of narrative about that. And they've always got to be stopped someplace. Many times they stop at um, a place that they think is an island, but it's actually a whale. So they set up their camp and they live on this whale. This is one of the miracles of the journey that they're, uh, that they're on this whale. They think they're on land. Um, and the whale is a friendly whale who's kind of watching after them. So, you know, nature is miraculous all the way through this, um, this wonderful uh, navigatio. Uh, so uh, near the end of the journey, they found an island uh, and on it lived Paul the Hermit. I love it, Paul is on it. Um, Paul the Hermit, not our Paul, not, not Jackson Paul, but Paul the Hermit told them that he never felt hunger or thirst ever. And so this they took to be the sign that they had found the island of paradise, right? Because the bishop had said, there's a place from uh, where you will, you will not have no hunger and no thirst, right? And so they, they think they found paradise. And uh, Paul the Hermit tells them, look, I just tapped this uh, rock here and a spring of water comes up every Sunday, right? So this is the miraculous uh, water from the rock, again, a reference to be sure um, to the Moses tradition. So what else is happening on this? Major themes, spiritual warfare. You know, people are encountering fear. They're encountering demonic things. They're encountering all kinds of internal and external challenges, right? They're searching for the promised land. The natural creation presents itself to them, especially in times of great fear and consternation. There's the divine presence, and that comes to them through water animals like the whale, through birds, bees, and fragrance. Uh, the monastic hours are observed um, with great particularity. These provide the structure of the whole narrative, the structure of time, Lent, Easter, and Sundays are primary timekeepers um, in, in the Navigatio, which really goes on for years. Um, and then all the way through, they're repeating the Psalms. So you can really feel monastic life here. This is, this is a monastery in a boat. Right, and they continue all the monastic practices as they go along. So they're looking for Paradise Island, they find Paradise Island at the end, and then they all go home. <clears throat> but what did Brendan really do? Right? I mean, so obviously that's fanciful, it's a fanciful story. Um, he probably did really go in a boat. He probably even went in a boat all the way to Iona, we think. Um, Many uh, are the people who think that he founded, uh, he, he found North America, right? That this journey went all the way to North America. And there are all these maps you can find of, you know, Brendan's journey going all the way over to Newfoundland and so on. And Tim Severin, who may be known to some of you, in 1976 built a 36 foot boat, emulating the boat of, uh, of Brendan and sailed to Newfoundland in that boat to prove that this was doable and it just made a whole lot more converts to this theory that Brendan actually discovered uh, the new world well before Columbus uh, and others. All right, uh, he did now in the, in the world of what he actually, what we actually know that he did, he did found several monasteries. One at Ardfert um, near the well of his baptism and one at Clonfert at the place of his death. And I'll have some images uh, of those. He is the patron saint of boatmen, mariners, travelers. I love this one, elderly adventurers um, and whales, of course. So here are some Brendan sites. Um, 
that we visited, right? Um, we didn't get to do everything exactly sort of in order of his life. So we went to his baptismal pool kind of later than we climbed Mount Brandon. He <laughs> went up Mount Brandon before he took his voyage. So yeah, we didn't do things exactly in the right order. But this is the launch site. This is what is considered to be the launch site where he put his boat in to go on the voyage. And near there, there is this charming um, little remembrance of him, a memorial to him. And he's actually in this boat on the other side. But again, to, I, I don't, I think I might have a picture of him in it on the other side of the boat. So, um, Here's his baptismal well. I think this was in the advertisement for this uh, show tonight. This is Jen Strawbridge, who is a priest uh, today in England and is a professor of religion at Mansfield College at Oxford. Um, but she came through our church. She was a Washington only student. Um, and she went to England, came back to Yale Divinity School, got, a, got her MDiv, was ordained. Um, a priest and then went back to do a PhD at Oxford and now she's still there. And she came to help me make in the first sense of to creating this pilgrimage. She came to help me do that in 2016. And there she is holding, she's down in Brendan's Holy Well, the well of his baptism, holding some of the water, which we did not drink. It was pretty, pretty scuzzy looking, pretty slimy. Um, but that is his baptismal well. And then um, here's a tree, oops, here's a tree at his baptismal site. And so we, I talk about sacred trees and holy trees in Ireland. You'll see lots of times trees just dripping with, um, ro with rosary beads, with ribbons um, at holy sites. So in fact, you know, making the tree itself uh, a part of the holiness of the of the place. So this one happened to be there with that very beautiful rosary hung on it and, and obviously um, sacrificed to that tree. Um, Clonfort is, uh, the, is another a, a monastery that he founded. Um, and of course, this would have been back in the sixth century, but it is now actually this church is uh, an Anglican church. The church itself is the foundations go to the sixth century, but the church building that you see is 12th century, and it has an extraordinary, extraordinary entrance here. Um, and I think I have a close up of the carving on that. But I want you to take a look at the condition of the front of that building. And I want you to think about the wind and the rain and the fact that this is unprotected and it's extraordinary 12th century Romanesque carving. And it just breaks your heart um, to, to see it and to know it's just dissolving, you know, by the minute. This lovely um, mermaid is actually an interior decoration in the church and a very prominent one as well. Um, so, uh, you know, maritime images uh, decorate this church, again, um, uh, about Brendan, right? Brendan, the navigator, uh, is the founder of this community. These are our students. They were actually um, singing, maybe not at this point, but they were singing A Journey of a Thousand Miles uh, as they came out of this church. Here's the holy tree near Clonfert. Um, shoot. Uh, so at Clonfert, um, where uh, Brendan is buried, all right, especially holy site because he's buried there, just a few hundred yards away, there is this tree. And it's kind of hard to get to it, but obviously people do. Uh, there are all kinds of things left here from, you know, baby shoes. You can see some baby shoes hanging here to, you know, lots of rosaries, all kinds of things here. It looks kind of awful really it looks kind of um, kind of junky and trashy in a way but the people here um, who who are the sort of people who take care of the church nearby um, are really offended if you say this this looks trashy right they wouldn't clean it up for anything on earth because these are all these are all things people have left in earnest people who have left um, their, their thoughts, their prayers, their sorrows at this place. Um, so it's a holy tree now. 
near Clondrot Cathedral. Um, our own pilgrimage, of course, took in Mount Brandon, which is a mountain that is thought to have been climbed by Brandon as he was contemplating his great navigation and his obedience uh, to this call to get on, on the water. Um, and by the way, he remained obedient uh, to the degree that sometimes he would hear a voice that would be a divine voice or angelic voice just saying, put down your oars. Just don't, don't try to row, just see where you're taken, right? Um, so you can, you can feel a lot of spiritual um, uh, direction coming through the pilgrimage itself. Sometimes you just put down your oars and let the boat carry you, right? So anyway, here's, here's uh, Mount Brandon and the students having come. You can see how cloudy and foggy it is, but they made it even through the snow, the hail, the sleet. Um, and then at the very top, uh, at the apex, there is the Axis Mundi uh, of the cross and um, the students experience there, I can tell you um, uh, some of that uh, communitas, right? And collective effervescence of being together. Um, they sang together at the top. There were a lot of musicians in this group um, and it was a glorious thing to have, have arrived through, through serious danger actually. Sorry, this one's so, this is very near the end. This is uh, very small, but mm. this is a song. Uh, I don't have it, I don't have the music for it. And if Bill McCorkle does, maybe he'll put it on next time at the beginning or something. This is a song um, of Brendan that was written by Josh Harvey, known to a lot of you, and Christopher Edwards. They were students at, at WNL when they uh, went to uh, Ireland and saw, I think Josh has been there probably six times by now or more, but, um, but this they wrote about Brendan uh, because they were inspired by Brendan. So um, I'll read a couple of verses. Lord bless our journey, calm the sea and sky with your hand guide us to the promised land of saints. Our band of brethren risk life for farther shores, one holy mission to speak the word of God. High above the nearest mountain, spilling to the sea, the sea reflects the spaces in between. I kneel to kiss the meadow, emerald token of our home in this quiet corner of the earth. And then the last verse I'll read, morning breaks upon the dawning of the seventh year, the fire of slain sets spark to burn. That's uh, from the Patrick legend, the fire of slain. Tomorrow sail beneath another sky, we change the sky, but not the soul of man. Your hungers are rewarded. Look, your ship is ready to come in. You are going home. So that's a that's full of uh, Brendan-esque moments. And I, it, I have heard the music and I, I hope we can somehow get the music to everybody um, in the pilgrimage series. Just a little bit more of Brendan in art. Um, he's sort of everywhere um, when you start to look for him. Um, and there's again that same image that I gave you before. Um, a Brendan prayer uh, to close. And uh, this is said on, Brenda, we, on Brendan's feast day, right? Help me to journey beyond the familiar and into the unknown. Give me the faith to leave old ways and break fresh ground with you. Christ of the mysteries, I trust you to be stronger than each storm within me. I will trust in the darkness and know that my times are in your hand. Tune my spirit to the music of heaven and somehow make my obedience count for you. Amen. So that's it. <clears throat> We're almost at the hour. I don't, I think this goes for an hour, but I'm happy to take questions. Um, whatever. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, Wonderful. you're welcome. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Anybody have a, have a comment, a question? You're, you're muted. You're muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I couldn't help but think about, uh, you know, comparisons were running in my mind between 
the Irish pilgrimage and Brendan and St. James and San, the cult to Santiago. And I was thinking about, you know, when you first started talking about, well, that line from the poem, Rilke's poem, we grasp what we, I, I hate to paraphrase it. I can't remember. We grasp what we have not been able to grasp before. On well, we haven't grasped, grasped us. It's yes. Hard work. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, I was thinking about it. At first, when you were talking about the, um, the, that the catalyst for the sacred sort of in the, on the Irish pilgrimage was the majesty of the landscape, yes. you know? And I'm thinking how different this is from, you know, what, what we think about the pilgrimage to Santiago, much of that is based on myth and magic and folklore, you know, this character that was invented in Spain and, and, and gave rise to this cult of Santiago, the savior hero that helped the Christians retake their land from Islam. But then I started thinking, we were talking about Brendan and the, the water come, miracle is a part of this, this pilgrimage also very much so in the language of the pilgrimage. And maybe, you know, the sacred and the miraculous around us are, are, are around us all the time in many things and we just don't see them. And pilgrimage helps us, it clears our minds and helps us to see that, to communicate with this, with this sphere of miracle in, in the world itself. Yeah, I yeah, just, I, yeah. I love that formulation that pilgrimage helps us to see the sacred that's all around us all the time. Yeah. yeah that's absolutely the way it worked for me and for the students, I think, too. If I had time, I would show you there. Um, at the end of the course, they all did something we called ephemeral shrines. So um, the ephemeral shrine was to make something out of natural materials, things that would go back into nature so they weren't to leave anything that would become junk in the nature, in, in, the, in the natural world, to use sticks, stones, water, whatever, to make a shrine to say something about how this place had become more real to them, more holy to them in some ways. What were they marking? What was the memorial they wanted to leave? And, you know, it's just incredibly beautiful what they, what they left um, and how they described what they left. So again, it was about pilgrimage sort of helping them to recognize the sacred that was all around them all the time. It was, it was really a wonderful experience. So Alex, uh, Susan, now that Susan and I are elderly adventurers, <laughs> I, I wonder if uh, there are opportunities for anyone, whether they're elderly adventurers or just the casual adventurers to do something similar to what you were able to do with WNL students. Um, or do a pilgrimage like Brendan. Of course. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of ways to do it. There is an official uh, Brendan pilgrimage, and it's in May. Um, and so you can actually sign up and go to Ireland then and walk the, the pilgrim way of Brendan. Uh, but of course, you can do that with St. With Patrick. There's an 82-mile St. Patrick pilgrimage. Um, and you can also do it, set it up kind of privately. You know, there are people that we worked with in Ireland who would uh, in fact, I just heard from someone today who has set up his own business now, helping both colleges and individuals um, set up uh, pilgrimage and other kinds of tourism in, um, in Ireland. So, uh, you know, uh, Sean, Sean Paul uh, O'Connor, isn't that a great name? Sean Paul yeah, O'Connor <laughs> uh, is his name. And uh, he'd be happy to hear from you if you want to do it. He's, he's working with my friend Beverly Gavento, who's a biblical scholar. She's taking her whole family over and they're doing, they're doing stuff through, through him. But there are lots of ways to do it. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. You got to do Brandon because Brandon's really so cool. Yeah. Sounds like it. And yeah. thanks for introducing us to him. Not that I, I really did not know of Brendan. So thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Um, Alex, what, what struck me was uh, I looked, I did some, uh, you did an excellent job, but I did do a little research as you talked. And what's, what's <laughs> I love that. Me, People are looking at Looking up your stuff. People are fact-checking you, Alex. Yeah, you don't know, like people like me. In any case, <laughs> no, always, you're welcome to do it. Thank but you. I'm a, but I'm a, I consider myself a, a, a traveler. And uh, but I, but I and Tuck's laughing, but anyway. Uh, but but I, I what struck me was uh, beyond what you said, uh, you know, he was very Brendan was very active in uh, Scotland. 
in Wales. But then uh, one source I looked at very quickly, even France. So what I find amazing, uh, and we can say that about Paul, Peter, and many others, but in, that, in the world of his time, to be able to move around like that. And he's credited with finding uh, uh, monasteries and schools and, and uh, churches, having the time to do that, take the time in a place to establish something and then move on to other countries, uh, even across open seas to, to the continent. It's just amazing to me. Yeah, and, and you know, that's what they considered obedience to be, to be setting up these monasteries. So taking, taking the word, establishing monasteries, establishing cells of Christianity. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, what these guys are up so to. much travel beyond what, I mean, some people would get nervous about going, you know, the, you know leaving where they are and the, you know, the challenges or the trepidation about moving to other places, but for him to go on to his wills and then on to France even. And well, doing some work. well, David, though, one, yeah. thing, one thing I have come to understand uh, in my many trips to Scotland and Iona is that the way people got around was on the water. Right. I understand they that. not travel across the land. Oh, yeah, I understand that. It's yeah. still an ordeal for me to get to Iona because it's all across the land. And so, yes, he was far sailed around all these countries, but that was sort of the normal way to get places. Yeah, but, but I did note uh, the one cathedral we spent time on here tonight was dead center of Ireland, right in the middle of it, mm. uh, that one cathedral. And yeah, Clonfert, right in oh, the yeah. middle. Oh, yeah. Right in the yeah. middle. Dead, yeah. right, and, 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 and it's yeah. really hard to get to today. Let me tell you, the mm -hmm. bus drivers don't know where it is. You can't, you know, nobody yeah. goes there anymore. Yeah. And yeah. you could, you know, I wish the Anglicans would go there and fix that, uh, put something up to save that doorway, uh, that 12th century fabulous carving is going, going away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I want to mention something because it's relevant to what you're saying about traveling on the water. And that's just something that's really fun to watch. Um, and it, it connects us to the Camino um, last week. Um, I, I think I said last week that there was a, uh, there, there was a, a site from which one started the Camino in, in Ireland, right, to get to Spain. And so there's a wonderful film that's just out at, that we can just get in the last couple of years called um, The Camino Voyage. And it shows these guys, these Irish guys, building the boat. And they, they built a boat like Brendan's boat, building the boat, getting in the boat, traveling around the tip, you know, getting into Ireland, I mean, into the sea in Ireland, and then traveling down to France and going on down to Spain. So it, it, it follow, the film follows them all this route which is all a water route, right? Until they get to, to where they're gonna walk. They don't actually ever walk. <laughs> they just stay in the water. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful piece. And the, the hero of it um, is a, as a man, oh gosh, his name slips my mind, but he was a great uh, repository of Irish lore and our students got to know him in the years that Mark Connor took uh, the students to Ireland. And he actually died in the water, not on that voyage, but he did die uh, in a kind of a boat capsizing accident. But the, that makes the whole thing all that much more somehow powerful. But, but look it up, the Camino Voyage, it's, it's available. You can get it through, I don't know, Amazon or something like that. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful film. There's a lot of music in it. Um, Brendan Begley, who's a great uh, musician, who's actually been here uh, to, to play with the, uh, oh, one of the great Irish bands that came here. Brendan Begley uh, is in it and he plays his um, harmonium all the way through it. It's just, it's gorgeous. So I recommend it. It ties the Irish together with the Camino Santiago and, you know, it's a good way to keep a, keep a theme going through our pilgrimage course. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Lots of else, Alex, but next.